Oh, so nice and quiet. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for this week's Arbor Lecture, which is hosted in um, cooperation with the Museum's Celebration of Native American Heritage Month. I'll begin today's presentation, I forgot the slide, but um, by acknowledging that the Field Museum was built upon the traditional homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwe nations, as well as the Ho-Chunk, Winnebago, Meskwaki, Sauk, and Miami nations. The area we now call Chicago was the traditional homelands of many indigenous nations and continues to be an important place of trade, worship, and interaction for diverse native peoples. This land was and remains native land. I am very excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Crystal Sosi. Dr. Sosi is Diné, a citizen of the Navajo Nation and an indigenous geneticist and bioethicist. She's an assistant professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and is a profound and renowned advocate for indigenous genomic data sovereignty. She received both her bachelor's of science in microbiology and master's in bioethics at ASU, a master's of public health in genetic epidemiology from Vanderbilt, and her PhD in genomics and health disparities also at Vanderbilt. Her laboratory work has impacted and benefited disease research and treatment. And in this work, she became keenly aware of the gaping disparities and inequalities in medical research and healthcare, particularly for indigenous communities. Um, so now she works to actively address these issues. Dr. Sosi is the co-founder of the Native Biodata Consortium, the first indigenous-led biobank in the US. She's a global chair in Enrich, the Equity for Indigenous Research and Innovation Coordinating Hub, and serves on various other committees involving genetics, bioethics, STEM, uh, and data sovereignty. I'm sure I'm missing a lot. You've got many accolades um, to note. So her talk today is entitled, We Were Not Discovered, Unsettling Settler Scientist DNA-Based Constructs of Indigeneity. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Crystal Sosi. Yet a shekinachini, nashlito, nakaidin e bashachini. Thank you so much. It is my honor to be in front of you today in such an esteemed institution to talk about such an impactful subject matter that I think is incredibly relevant and salient uh, considering this month, but also considering the conversations related to race and also um, genetic ancestry in, in our my spaces of human health, ethics as it relates to paleogenomic works and also biodiversity and biocollections. I first wanna start with this image. So this is uh, Jules Bedoni, he is Dene, he's a mural uh, artist painter. And he painted this actually in, um, when the height of Indigenous Peoples Day versus Columbus Day was at its, um, uh, you know, of subject a few years ago. And this is shadow puppetry in terms of connecting these conversations with actually our moves to decolonize our institutions. And I kind of love the figure that's in the middle to you right of, of this. But I do want to start with this, 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 point that we were not discovered. And this is a point that I think is a, 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 um, of hubris that many settlers and settler institutions like to poise themselves as being the pinnacle of those that are doing discovery, but based off of indigenous people's knowledges and our DNA. So we start with the doctrine of discovery, which through papal bulls gave European nations superseding rights over us barbarous nations and our lands upon their discovery. This was upheld by a then semi-new uh, US Supreme Court that stated that the principal discovery by conquest of our indigenous nations gave the US absolute rights and authority over our lands, waters, and resources. This, site, this doctrine and this ruling was upheld relatively recently to disenfranchise the Oneida nations of their own historic land claims. And we see repeatedly through time that settlers and settler institutions have co-opted indigenous traditional ecological knowledges and plant wisdoms as part of their discovery. 
This also translates into the biological anthropology space in which um, uncovered or undiscovered genetic variation is often built on indigenous peoples and our bodies and extracted from data collected from those sources. And we see a lot of, of, of allusions to frontierism and that indigenous peoples and indigenous DNA is like a font for hidden uncovered gene variation. And if only we can just get more indigenous peoples recruited and involved in genetics research, oh, how could this benefit humankind or mankind? So we get headlines and actually type article titles such as the human genetic history of America is the final frontier. Discover your Native American ancestry by family tree DNA. Patterns of Native American gene discovery yet unexplored. Time is short, the key to acquiring genetic samples from world's remaining indigenous peoples whose ethnic and genetic identities are isolated, but such distinct peoples, languages, and cultures are quickly vanishing. And recently, describing a Colombian and Andean community as ideal for study because they, quote, escaped from complete admixture given their warrior nature and persistent culture. Yeah, great. So uh, when recently, at the start of this year, the Vatican repudiated this doctrine of discovery, many indigenous nations in the Americas rejoiced. But then also they asked, where's our land back? It's great that you are apologizing for centuries of harm onto our peoples, but where's the real justice and repatriation and matriation of not only land, but also data. So there are not movements toward land back. I also encourage everyone to be part of the data back movement. But I also want to acknowledge that far too often narratives of our peoples have been largely told from an outsider's point of view. And not only is this a, a different perspective from our origins and our cultural stories, but it's also ultimately disempowering because it doesn't acknowledge that our people have given and provided these stories and narratives for our peoples for centuries and time immemorial. And while there are many indigenous ways of knowledge and each has its own ontopistemological worldview and construction of embodiment, I want to very briefly describe my own peoples uh, um, and our own narratives and contrast that with narratives that settlers continue to use and, and, and perpetuate of our own. So I wanna start talking about Dine, which are, is my people. I spoke originally in Dine Pizad when I introduced myself and my clans, but also describe how we moved from calling ourselves Diné to other people using Navajo as a descriptor. So we're relatively recent compared to other, like for instance, Otham uh, communities that predate us in the Southwestern region. We have Ke, which is our clanship, which is an exogamous form of marriage and a clanship system of relationality and kinship. And we expanded by taking on people from other tribes as well. And we've always acknowledged that our identity is heterogeneous and that it comes from acquisition of peoples from our neighbors. So you can see this, that at one point, and it's estimated, um, like we had over 400 clans at some point, that we actually have our clan names from the people that we have um, developed kinship ties with. So for instance, one of my clans, the Kaidanaes, Mexican people's clans, but we also have clans that acknowledge, for instance, our peoples from Zuni and this Pueblo, Ute, Tewa, Mescalero Apache, and so on. And it wasn't until the Wheeler Howard Act of 1934 that the US government then imposed the situate this, this um, blood quantum laws that were legally defined racial population groups. And this is where we get a lot of conflation of what constitutes a four-fourths full-blooded indigenous person. And so we start to get these conflations of belonging to one peoples, when in reality, we come from multiple peoples. So we get here now, this, this at the same time, this eugenics movement of descripting, uh, describing our peoples to now away from uh, our own people's narratives. So how do we reconcile this identity 
This blood system was imposed upon us to dilute our rights to these resources. It was originally a sociopolitical construct, not one rooted in, in biology. Uh, so tying genetics by ancestry is incurrent with our traditional system, and this is which is a system that we've been using for our kinship for centuries. And this blood quantum policy now drives a wedge between members of our communities by using blood to privilege some, discredit others, and ultimately racialize Native communities. And in order to re remove these harms, we have to move beyond histories that rely on this blood. I also want to point that the field of human genetics one of the founders of this field is James Neal. And he writes this about our, our peoples, that over the world, primitive peoples are being projected in a few generations from a stone age to an atomic age culture. And in making this transition, they'll be called upon to telescope into a few generations, biological and cultural adaptations, which have been extended over thousands of years in Europe which he uses as um, a synonym for modern man in other writings. To the extent that these adaptations involve genetic systems, here's a priceless opportunity to study biological selection. So racializing our people, biologically constructing our peoples as being essentially different from other populations, and viewing the destruction of our nations as not a biological evolutionary one, uh, as one of a biological evolutionary one, not a political act, and really describing this rush to sample our people before they disappear, as if our bodies are the next gold rush, and really positioning our bodies as sources of extraction for the benefit of science and mankind, but not for the benefit of our peoples. Because remember, we're already set to be extinguished and to vanish, but he's not concerned with those colonial factors, rather concerned to gather our DNA and our data before we cease to exist. So this actually gives me like an interesting uh, contrast of narratives of, of scientists describing our peoples versus like our as indigenous peoples view of science perpetuated onto us and perpetrated onto us. So in 2019, it's been described that the history of our populations is one of the most debated topics in the study of ancient human migrations. This story of mankind is one that many paleogenomicists um, use and are able to, um, you know, get sell in nature papers and a lot of grant funds and New York Times bestselling authors really like talking to journalists about how we need more data to study this, the story of us, the story of mankind. Whereas from indigenous peoples who write on, uh, on uh, this type of research that we've been researched to death. And this comes from indigenous scholars in an indigenous journal. So from our point of view, we ask, why are you so obsessed with us? And for a slightly updated meme, why are you so obsessed with us for the Regina George? And, you know, we only need to look in the past decade um, of sequencing technologies as, as dovetailed onto the field of paleogenomics to understand that there's a lot of interest in collecting data from our ancestors and our peoples. But this is not a story of us. It's more for in our perspective, a story of you all, you guys. We have our own origin narratives. So we really don't need to buy in to this larger narrative if we don't want to. We also have to remember the hubris of this all, that even among scientists and scholars, there's no single narrative of, of history. There are a lot of different competing uh, uh, hypotheses on the origin of, of humankind, uh, stretching from the out of Africa hypothesis to multi-regional uh, hypotheses and some scalar spectrum of them both. So while scientists debate amongst themselves as to what is the right narrative, this Western perspective is repeatedly prioritized over our own narratives which is incredibly interesting. Now, when we think about this extraction of data and DNA, it doesn't end with our body of our ancestors. It also includes our contemporary descendants. This rush to sample us is something that is rooted in large scale diversity uh, uh, subjects and, 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 and projects. We need not to look further than the Human Genome Diversity Project, which is the one that predates current ones like the All of Us Research Program, which started as a, a 
like uh, to map genetic variation of human populations worldwide. And even then described by Luca Cavalli Sforza as a race to sample us before we vanished. So again, not caring about the colonial factors that and the political factors that are like really challenging our ways of life, but really just like, nope, we gotta get their data before they disappear. Unsurprisingly, indigenous groups worldwide didn't like this narrative and went to the United Nation repeatedly uh, asking for cessation of these diversity projects, <clears throat> citing even then concerns related to gene patenting and biocommercialization of our, our, our biomarkers. In 2005, HGDP published their own successful recruitment of 51 global populations to include five indigenous groups. And if you look at the map, there's something very curious here. There are no indigenous groups in the US. They have had federally recognized sovereignty and have very, uh, for very distinct reasons related to harms, especially in the early 2000s, decided not to participate in genetics research. So the sampling can be argued occurs in geographies and spaces where indigenous peoples are disenfranchised and disempowered, who are not being protected. And yet this is where the source of, of collection of DNA is coming from, which asks us, are we just continuing to benefit from the continued disenfranchisement and disempowerment of these individuals and these peoples? In response to the publication of this, of this project, we have UNDRIP, which is the Declaration on Indigenous Peoples' Rights to Genetic Resources and Knowledges. It was a petition signed by over 683 Indigenous nations worldwide asking for the cessation of continued large-scale diversity projects, including the, the Genographic Project by National Geographic. So we get now to 2008, 2012, when 23andMe comes out and emerges as Time Magazine's Invention of the Year. What are they using for their estimates of Native American ancestry? They are using openly sourced available information from those large scale diversity projects. Those questions about commercialization, here we have it. Now, commercial companies benefiting from access to those D the DNA data sets from disempowered communities. And we ask too, like how relevant are those um, inferential statements for U.S. Indigenous groups who I just stated didn't participate in this type of research. So we have now an, uh, like a, a conflation of everyone being Indigenous peoples being of this biological pan-Indigenous whole, when in reality we have over uh, 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. with their own distinct cultural and language histories notwithstanding their own distinct genetic histories. And yet we're falling into this narrative that we are somehow um, a part of this pan-Indigenous whole and also forgetting the role of justice and equity in terms of the use and access of that samples and material. Because meanwhile, many of those groups in Central and South America are waiting for the therapeutics that were promised to them by researchers in exchange for access to their DNA material. And now we, here we are in 2023 toward the ends of it and they are still waiting. So now we ask what's happening to that information. And here we have a great excellent quote by native Hawaiian geneticist, Dr. Kayla Fox, who states that raw data, including DSI derived from human genomes have emerged as a top global commodity. In a few years, direct-to-consumer testing companies have been able to amass data sets in the millions and have been able to profit in the billions. Ancestry DNA before being sold to a venture capital firm Blackstone for $4.7 billion profited a billion dollars every holiday quarter. People gifting each other the, the gift of their history underneath the Christmas tree. Um, we also have a 23andMe who, before getting a massive wrist slap by uh, the FDA, uh, started as an entertainment company and now has shifted to selling exclusive access to their data sets to GlaxoSmithKline for a large sum of money. And part of this is consumers asking the question of who am I 
and looking to genetic ancestry testing as a source of that, that information. Not also understanding that they are allowing and permitting co-optation of their own use and data. We also cynically ask, who is this benefiting? Well, it seems to be benefiting pharmaceutical companies. Many people state that cynically that part of the reason why uh, compared to the cost of, of genotyping and sequencing information at the start of, of, of when these companies emerged, they were able to sell this, uh, the test so cheaply to consumers was to quickly amass the data sets just so that they could particularly sell exclusive access to, to drug companies for creating drug targets. But the number one question asked by consumers to Ancestry DNA by their own blog is, why is my Native American ancestry not showing up? Which is incredibly interesting. So here is an ad by uh, an actress whose name is Kim, uh, who um, is, is, is um, in one uh, early slide in this Ancestry DNA commercial, is stating how she wants to um, connect with a story as rooted in, in family lore that she has a Native American ancestor. She takes a task and lo and behold, in the next frame, a bunch of pots show up behind her. Uh, <laughs> and, and very cynically, uh, there's this, this, this excellent article in 2018 uh, looking at public facing websites for 25 direct to consumer companies who were found to offer services measuring Native American ancestry. And 20 of them stated that consumers would be able to find their ancestral origins. Most were pretty cautious in stating that these could not be used for legal claims for, for tribal citizenship, but five of them stated that they could, that people could use these tests as sufficient for tribal enrollment. What's happening, according to Wallhalaji et al, is that these com companies are promising an interchangeability of ancestral and personal identity that promotes a problematic causal relationship between genetic and self identity. By drawing on public faith, on scientific authority, people are actually making statements about their own identities while believing them to be validated by genetic science. What people don't understand is that there are a lot of suppositions that are made when we sample admixed individuals against a reference group. Now, this is a more simplified PCA plot looking at Black Americans uh, against um, individuals in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and European individuals. But what ends up happening is that there is some artificial gating that occurs that only those that are 80% similar, percent similar to uh, those of uh, Sub-Saharan African ancestry are included in genetic studies and some of uh, a huge portion of them are dropped. So of course, you know, what about the lived experience of those other 80% of individuals? When we're talking about social and structural determinants of health, what are we missing when we start focusing on least admixed individuals, which is a cloaked term for biologically pure. There is a lot of uh, suppositions uh, uh, that are created in these type of plots. And we, particularly as it relates to Native Americans, we are also buying into this false narrative. And we are also you know, believing to be many Native Americans to be part of this, this genetic whole, sometimes pooling Native Americans with distinct genetic histories into one stratum, leading to mixed effects issues and also incorrect inferential statements that benefit no one. Uh, so there's a lot of assumptions of biological purity, reference using against incorrect reference populations with distinct histories, um, and also just a lot of problematic statements that are being used to talk about Native Americans with real uh, problems as rooted in other types of social and structural um, issues. What can happen is that these tests can be politicized. Elizabeth Warren, when she announced her presidential candidacy, announced it using also um, a genetic test from MacArthur Genius Awardee and a very world-class, uh, um, renowned population geneticist, Carlos Bustamante, basically stating, look, this individual who is uh, an incredible geneticist has shown that my family history is true. Just incredibly interesting when you consider that this is a very 
statistical inferential uh, statement using a reference group with very few individuals from relatively Central and South America, because remember, again, this doesn't include a reference group from US indigenous peoples. Uh, and, and, and these are very, very, um, there's a lot of suppositions that are made when we go from a PCA to a statement like this. Unsurprisingly, the tribal leader of the Cherokee Nation came out uh, with a response to state that a DNA test is useless to determine tribal citizenship. There are other factors here related to current lived experience and connection to individuals that determine this type of citizen ancestry, not related to blood. So have to state over and over again that indigeneity is not defined by biology and our histories do not need to be biologically reified. Why is this important? So what is going on in the field of paleogenomics and, and ancient DNA and now just increasingly in the health space overall is we get the inclusion of both indigenous ancestors and also contemporary descendants in the same data sets. Uh, and we have to start thinking more along the lines of, of stewardship and kinship across generations if we wanna do this type of research responsibly. We're also seeing a decreased distinction between research on ancestors and descendants. Uh, and, and it's incredibly interesting that we see more and more blurred lines between what constitutes consent from uh, living individuals versus non-living individuals, who is considered uh, um, human subjects research and who is not, even though we're all talking about homo sapiens. And also the jurisdictions between these two spaces are also being blurred as well, which is also when we think about the, the health space of, of exploring these questions that have real impact on current descendants, we are perhaps uh, um, legitimizing um, health questions that perhaps we, we need a little bit more of expansive knowledge uh, in order to do this with due, due diligence and justice. We also have to question how good are we in terms of our conversations of including contemporary descendants and community members in this space? This is work that is ongoing, but this was presented at um, an ASU conference called Doing Research in Indigenous Communities by my lab and my students. We are currently updating. This is a scoping review of literature since 2010 of research that includes indigenous peoples. And we barely just asked a, qu a question, uh, how much community engagement is, is is being done and, and research that's published. And we found that uh, only about 25% of patient DNA studies included some element of indigenous community engagement. Now there's a lot of questions here, like for instance, can we identify a community uh, descendant? That, that's a hard one. And also how are we defining community engagement or is if community engagement is already has been done, is it being disclosed in the publication space? We don't know, but this is also highlighting that the field can do better. And we can continue to improve as much as we can how we're conversing about these conversations in the academic discipline space. Because when we start thinking and making judgments about what constitutes non-human subjects research or what constitutes uh, DNA that does, does or does not need to have community consent, we start having the emergence of other types of, of data theft or data extracted from, from ancestors or even from soil below ancestors um, and making some sort of statements that impact current living indigenous individuals. So we have DNA collected out of rules of NAGPRA, DNA collected from environmental DNA soil, uh, samples from beneath our ancestors and around our ancestors. We also have DNA that's collected from unprotected groups who don't have federal recognition or sovereignty, and therefore um, just for some individuals means that they don't have to ask for community consent. As we get into these blurred spaces and the continued uh, uh, reification of what constitutes an indigenous genome or indigenous reference genome, we have a lot of emerging new projects like the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium, uh, which among many of the, of the aims of this project wants to expand the inclusion of diverse groups and how we converse about 
diversity as it relates to a human reference genome. But some of this, of course, is a question of how exactly do we do work as it relates to indigenous people in this space well, without again, falling back into these uh, same uh, presupposing notions. Uh, so we really have to think about what is the best way to do this work to rep that represents indigenous peoples that avoids the exploitation of the past. The step between creating an indigenous specific platform to its commercial use is very low. So before uh, sequencing uh, became uh, more accessible as the cost of, of that technology dropped, we had more reliant on, on ancestry specific platforms uh, like through, through Affymetrics. And um, they actually marketed ancestry specific platforms. There was um, one specific to African American and African individuals, one specific to Asian individuals. There was another one that was launched prior. Um, um, the most recent one was a Latin population. It was just a matter of time before a Native American specific platform. Uh, emerged as, as a, a commercial entity. And yet we have a lot in the publication uh, at this time, a lot of ancestral informative markers, which was a, a more of the technology at the time uh, that existed from communities though, like the Otham peoples that actually very infamously removed themselves from continued NIH research. This is a community that between 1965 and 2000, uh, um, had in participation some work with the NIH, NADDK in Phoenix to study type two diabetes. And when it realized, they realized that they could create um, preventative health services for their own people, decided and asked the question like, what are we gaining from this project? And when they said that they were just the, deriving very little benefit from the continued participation, they actually removed themselves from the study but their samples continue to be used for research. How ethical is that? Is a question we should be asking ourselves. It's certainly legal, but as we are starting to advance on our conversations as it relates to community engagement and equitable research, we have to ask whether or not these type of practices continue to be ethical, especially as I mentioned over and over again, the path from the collection of DNA from and material from, from indigenous peoples to its commercial value is very limited. We also have to rethink these constructs of one person belonging to one tribe. Too often indigenous peoples are bucketed as belonging into one uh, a, a tribal nation label. And we forget that gene flow and drift continue to occur in real time, certainly since 1934. And we do a disservice when we default to these colonial definitions of indigeneity and that we don't acknowledge that indigenous peoples have and continue to belong to different tribal nations. It's just poor science. We engage in pan-indigeneity when we focus on biologically pure or least side mixed. We also talking about uh, recruitment of a remote isolated indigenous peoples as constituting an ideal laboratory is objectifying. Similarly, describing founder populations as opposed to founder events is also objectifying and also whitewashing in literature, genocide as a bottleneck effect event and having to fight with editors to use a term like genocide is also a form of racial harm and, and, and discrimination that continues onto our peoples. We also have to realize that in, in, in recent biomedical literature, these type of genomic narratives reify negative stereotypes that have been imposed on our peoples as well. So we not only, we only need to look when we search terms like Native American genetics and alcohol abuse to find over 120 plus peer reviewed articles on this topic. And yet, if we look at just epidemiologic data, we show that the prevalence of, of substance abuse and alcohol abuse is actually the same or lower in tribal nations compared to the dominant population. So really asking ourselves, what are we using DNA for and to privilege what kind of narrative? We also look at like type two diabetes. And, and you know, this is a, an older paper, but it shows that often people on one side of this very recent geographic boundary have a different instance and prevalence rate of type two diabetes and their relatives further north. 
pointing, of course, to other types of colonial factors and related to imposition of uh, starch diets onto the, as opposed to like genetic, uh, genet purely genetic causes. And again, we had to ask ourselves, how are we classifying indigenous peoples in this research if we're still to continue to use colonial names like Pima as opposed to more of their culture respectful term Otham in research. I do want to highlight that there have been multiple um, recent conversations as it relates to race, genetic race in, 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 in conversations just this year and, and highlight this excellent report um, that states that researchers should not continue to use race as proxy for human gene variation because it supports this pervasive misconception that humans can be grouped into discrete innate biological categories. And that when we start this question about population descriptors and labels, we also have to, uh, of course, state, ask ourselves who's doing the labeling um, and that researchers should defer to communities involving them in conducting science that would truly address the disparities that they can face. So I've given you a lot of history and a lot of the harms that we have seen. Of course, the next question is what can we do? One thing that we can do first for in, uh, living indigenous individuals is just rethink what constitutes informed consent. Um, and many of our standard informed consent languages standard uh, focus on risk benefits at the individual level, which is already culturally inconsistent with how indigenous peoples govern. They uh, confer to a more communitarian set of, of ethics and group ethics and group consent and group risk. We also have to stop telling ourselves that simply removing personally identifiable information is enough to remove the risk of re-identification. Certainly for small underrepresented groups, it is incredibly easy to re-identify a single individual with as few as three parameters um, as shown in many different bioinformatics publications. But for people that are from small communities, one person especially with large family sizes, can re-identify a large portion of that community. So there's a lot of potential here for racial discrimination and race, genomic racial profiling as well. And so the ethically, the standard for individual informed consent is inadequate for indigenous communities, especially as it relates to genomics. And we also have to start thinking about community consent as well. I also wanna highlight that ancestors are not objects. This is actually, uh, a, a, conversation that I'm taking from a domestic violence uh, a, a field of inquiry, which have started to really uh, look and examine this language as it relates to objectification and harm. And when I started reading papers like this and others, I realized that there was a lot of parallels in this conversation of treating our human ancestors as objects. And that when we use language like objects, we dehumanize and disrespect them, but we also diminish the harms perpetuated onto our ancestors and their descendants. And it also like removes some of the potential punitive actions that we can hold onto researchers to hold them accountable if they are, are happen to perpetuate harms onto not only the, our ancestors, but living individuals. So we really have to think about the cycles of violence that we continue to use over and over again when we just continue to think about our, our people, our humans, our ancestors as objects. We also must stop pretending that ethics itself is not colonial and also not rooted in biases. So um, the image on the left comes from a publication from a large cohort of, of, of paleogenomicist museum curators and practitioners in the space of ancient DNA who wrote the rules of their own engagement, so to speak. Uh, and of course, the question here is, aren't you just writing rules that you or yourselves are defining to operate and defining what is and what is not ethical. Uh, and, and that alone can tell you that ethics and guidelines and, and uh, standard operating procedures and best practices itself can support colonial notions as, as uh, figures of power imposed on other individuals. So this is why it's so important to ground these types of conversations, including also community 
uh, members and descendants as well. Uh, so that we're not just privileging those that constantly are going to benefit from access to ancestors and other types of objects and artifacts and source materials. We also must recognize the importance of indigenous genomic sovereignty. That's just the right of indigenous nations and peoples to exercise authority, agency, and autonomy related to their genomic data. And I really want to high underscore the fact that this is intrinsically defined by communities and it's not up for colonial powers to define, make these distinguish these definitions for indigenous peoples themselves. Because when we do that, then we start forgetting that we are also need to protect indigenous peoples in other realms like native Hawaiians who are unrecognized and have a different type of recognition status in the US. Indigenous peoples from under unrecognized or state recognized tribes, indigenous migrants from outside the US who are seeking asylum at our borders and also urban indigenous peoples which constitute according to the last census 80% of indigenous peoples um, in the US. I also want to highlight that it is so important to uplift indigenous community governance and also the up and coming uh, indigenous led biological data repositories, such as the Native Biodata Consortium, of which I'm co founder with other indigenous scientists and community members. But once we start thinking about creating institutions and um, infrastructures related to uh, housing data, we can also start about thinking about advancing how we um, um, grant access to researchers and other individuals outside the community. And notice that I'm, I'm shifting the direction to language of community members granting access to outsiders here. But we can use things like rooted in machine learning approaches like blockchaining and federated learning to really advance on how we are thinking about data sharing and data access rules. Um, we can also think about advancing our consent models instead of um, granting broad consent for everything, which has caused a lot of problems, including a very infamous lawsuit in which the Havasupai Nation sued the Arizona Board of Regents. We can also think about other more advanced adaptive consent models as rooted into dynamic consent. We can also think about metadata labeling for data that's been um, uh, collected and accessioned in, in settler institutions. Think about uh, use of tag um, digital markers defining attribution access and use rights for indigenous cultural heritage, and also tagging provenance, transparency, integrity um, for rules related to research engagement or uh, collection and, and um, continued research use. This is a, um, a project that's advanced by local context, which acknowledges that indigenous people have inherent sovereignty over their knowledge and data. And they have created these set of tags and labels also to include tagging along with sequence information so that researchers know whether or not um, the information has been consented for use and for what purposes by an indigenous community or not. So when I start thinking about data as a resource, I actually start thinking more about creating local indigenous economies. So when we start from just thinking about engagement at a very basic level of research capacity and training of training indigenous data leaders, on top of that, we start thinking about creating laws and policies and resolutions, creating physical structures um, and also digital rules um, related to digital tools and eventually cloud solutions. When we start thinking about data as a resource and remembering that we have had so much natural resource extracted from us, we can actually start thinking about creating capital and bringing back our talent to tribal lands. And part of this is the repatriation, rematriation of data and, and peoples back to our communities to facilitate this type of work. I also want to remind that we there is a way to work with indigenous bio repositories and indigenous scientists and with university partners to uh, re, uh, to return legacy samples that have been collected under past outdated ethical standards back to communities. And this is a much better pathway to justice compared to the alternative, which is selling this access and information to other entities without disclosing to indigenous peoples that this sampling hadn't ta had taken place. And really that the key, if we're gonna talk about 
repairing trust and rebuilding these relations involves rethinking how we are conducting this research. I want to end by stating that we must reconcile the widening disparity between practicing the science upon us and think about transforming the science with us, that indigenous peoples can no longer be passive participants in science. And we wish to elevate attention to indigenous data sovereignties commensurate with the field's exploitation of our genomes. And ultimately indigenous people should have sovereignty over our data. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna do, we've got a little bit of time for questions. We do have a hard stop at one. So um, if there are any questions over Zoom and then if anybody has questions in the room, please use the mic so that people on Zoom can hear you. Yes. Um, I don't, do I really need that? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, I guess I really need that. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Coming at me from the right. I had to, can you hear me? Um, th this is wonderful. I, the, my, my first thought is uh, the more people like you are uh, coming from an indigenous perspective, a step up, maybe change can finally happen. You, much of what you've talked about, people at Field Museum, myself, for example, have been talking about for 50 years and it hasn't happened. But I would like to suggest that one of the things I want to hear from anyone, but particularly people who, whose genes want to be sampled, is not, you know, what is data, but what is the question you're asking? And that is not framed well enough. Believe me, I have friends who are geneticists, and I keep saying, why are you doing this? And they don't have a good answer. And they come up with something like the, the a computer program called Structure. And, and, and you think, well, maybe you ought to talk to some people who are not in the, the sort of northern global community and realize that people do have a different way of talking about being human in the communities. So I, I applaud what you're doing. It's not easy, but you, we really need you all outside the acad academy and outside the museum to say it has to be done differently. But that question, why do you want this data? Has to be one that you also make very clear. Thank you. I also want to add to that, what's the benefit to the communities, right? Um, in a different slide deck, when I talk more about the health uh, related outcomes, I, I talk about how in 2007, a New York Times reporter went back to one of the communities in, in South America, in the Amazonia region, in which uh, samples data DNA had been taken. And they promised uh, this community, we will give you therapeutics and um, for the things that are uh, ailing your, your community. And, you know, the New York Times reporter had to tell them, well, your, your information is definitely accessible to researchers. There is now a, non, a, a cell repository that's selling access to your material at a rate of $75 to $85 a vial. Um, and to which they were, the, the tribal leader stated, we were exploited, duped. We are still waiting for this promised therapeutics and we are dismayed effectively to learn that other people are benefiting from this information, whereas the original promise that was given to us continues to be um, just ignored. And of course, I compare this to the NIH, NIGMS's response, like this was done and, and consented according to field standards and it's going to benefit mankind. Um, but I do ask researchers, you know, what are you doing to ensure that the promises that you're giving to individuals in exchange for the material are, are, are being upheld? And researchers would say, well, that's not my domain. My domain is to advance the research, publish the piece, and it's somebody else's responsibility to to ensure that their benefit goes back to the community or that's communicated back. And 
you know, that kicking the can down the road is where we are right now, several decades post each GDP or even other types of legacy samples. And we're still promise, asking indigenous peoples to participate in genetics and genomics research while still haven't even delivering back on our original promises. And what we're doing is actually engaging in a cycle of victim blaming almost and coercion when we tell them, well, now you must be, and you should be involved in precision medicine genomics research. Otherwise your people will continue to die. That is the message that we're giving to tribal leaders and community members. I'm forgetting that no, the, there are severe structural challenges in delivering even basic preventative healthcare to indigenous peoples that promising the next innovations in genetics and genomics medicine is just not gonna translate in the same ways. And we have to be cognizant of these real challenges if we are going to collect information material from, from indigenous peoples. But in the space of like collections now, um, absent um, wanting to forge these tribal, tribal relationships with community partners, because that takes time. And frankly, a lot of researchers are not trained uh, to do community engagement or qualitative research even, that we're looking as researchers and academics to already collected or already consented sampling to include biocollections. And there's, this is why the jurisdiction of what constitutes human versus non-human subjects research or legacy sampling or, or residual samples is, is, is an emergent topic that we need to be cognizant of. I have an example. Yeah. I have to our credit, I would like to think that back in the mid 1990s, the UIC and the Field Museum were about to send a proposal to do genetics research on the north coast of New Guinea. And as the curator, I eventually asked, what's the local benefit? And there was none. And I was a bad guy. And we never sent the proposal in. Well, you know, sometimes history and time. So thank you, um, but also we need people to continue to have accountability onto other individuals as well. I hate to say it, but part of like the dueling ethical conversations right now also involve unfortunately some naming and shaming, like naming and shaming, having to highlight the continued harms that are occurring anew um, and reconciling with the fact that there really is less accountability and punitive actions for researchers that do inflict harm into communities. Because part of the definition of what constitutes harm is different in a Western academic space compared to an indigenous community framework. Awesome, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I was really, I loved the suggestion at the end about using blockchain to sort of make sure that data is, you know, especially from communities that might be vulnerable or communities that might be exploited, um, it could be tracked and like how it's used and who it's used could be tracked. And I was wondering if there are, if there is existing infrastructure and if, um, like if it would be useful, like I'm an ancient DNA researcher, but I work in ancient Rome, like could the data that I've generated support this infrastructure in a way so that it's, I don't know, is there, I guess, does it exist and are there ways that people could help and be allies elsewhere in the field? So, yeah. There are a couple of separate different questions. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, blockchaining has been used um, by other indigenous communities in other contexts. So for instance, there is a, an app called IndigiDAO, which um, is an indigenous uh, developed uh, app and organization to actually prevent um, fraud by artisans that are claiming that an artwork or piece is, is um, Native American created, right? Uh, so that there, there are apps in existence that are community grounded um, for, for those types of explorations. Native by Data Consortium, like on top of uh, a great expenditure on our parts to create 
a dynamic consent platform and data management system. On top of it, we are also uh, aiming to employ these machine learning approaches to advance on data sharing and governance so that these rules are community consented as to who can have access and who can see what. And um, that, that's something that is emerging. And I think other communities are, are thinking about how they can explore these, these, these solutions for themselves. The, the major up and coming uh, effort is the one that I want to highlight was local contacts with metadata labeling, because as much as we love to have this data rematriated, repatriated back into our uh, infrastructures and our, our, our community held uh, biobanks and, and other types of digital repositories, a lot of this information has already been collected elsewhere. So metadata tagging is also a way to sort of, um, as an intermediary solution that could be explored and, and in, implemented. And that's something like, for instance, I'm on the LC committee for the Earth Bio Genome Project which is a global sequencing project for um, non-human eukaryotic genomes. Um, but there, there's uh, conversations in place for incorporating these types of metadata tags onto the uh, plant materials and biospecimens that we're collecting, especially as it relates to information from tribal lands. So we can think about exploring these types of, these, this whole range of solutions in other contexts as well. Maybe one more quick question, if anybody has one. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sosi, and uh, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.